Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We've got another great show planned for you tonight. For the next hour, we'll be answering those landscape and garden questions that you've emailed to us. We're still not taking any questions by phone. Send us those questions or pictures to byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much as you can about your question. And as always, tell us where you live. Make sure you keep up to date with Backyard Farmer on our social media pages, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. We always start the show with samples, and you have an interesting plant and an interesting beastie. Well, I'm not really showing the plant. I know. That's your job. I know. <laughs> so what's the beastie? <laughs> the beastie I have tonight is a silver-spotted skipper caterpillar. Uh, these things are one of our most common skippers, also one of our larger skippers that we can find not only in the state but in the country. And they're readily identified as the adults by the large silver spot on the backside of the hind wing. When it comes to the caterpillars, you're going to be looking for a generally green caterpillar. I know not real descript, but they have this really unusual head with the brown collar right behind it. And then if he turns himself around enough, you can see the orange fake eye spots on the front of the caterpillar. Let's see if he cooperates for me here. Just nope. pick him up. <laughs> the camera guys told me no. <laughs> yeah, he's nervous. He's camera shy. Turn him around. See if that'll help. You can see those. Oh, they went away. But you can see those orange spots on the front. There's one on each side. And what they do is they feed on legumes. Mine came from a bristly locust, which is in my backyard. And my kids love catching these caterpillars off of them every year. Uh, they will feed on other legumes like soybeans, uh, black locusts, as well as your honey locust trees. So that's where to watch and find them. But they're all part of our native system. So they're, enjoy the fun. He's a pretty cool one. I mean, that's a kind of a creepy little This head. one's almost full that. grown, too. This should be about full size. Yeah, and those little skippers are really beautiful when they uh, do their thing too. So thank you for bringing that. Okay, what do we have, Bill? It's beautiful, right? It also beautiful. beautiful, right? <laughs> no, so this, uh, this is um, something that I saw um, at different irrigation and uh, garden centers, big box stores, and it really represents kind of um, this new connectivity we have with our irrigation systems and the World Wide Web and the internet, right? So this is, uh, um, a controller that we can link to our phone. This one works on a Bluetooth network, so uh, you can Bluetooth right to your phone and hook it to the end of your hose and then hook the other side up to um, you know, different types of irrigation. It could be your lawn sprinkler, it could be your drip emitters, it could be a soaker hose, it could be whatever you're using to water plants. Uh, and then instead of having to like reach down and try to you know, code it or make sure it's watering right, you can see right from your phone how you're watering. And so uh, it, as we get into the heat of July here and we're starting to water a lot more around the occasional you know, big thunderstorm deluge, uh, systems like this can really help to be sure we're becoming more efficient in how we're watering um, and just keep better track of how we're watering. Some of these even have apps that tell you how much water the plants have lost. Um, and they have uh, just different ways that we can really monitor our water. Uh, so we're not over applying or under applying. We're just applying the right amount to keep our plants uh, happy and healthy. And so this is something that we uh, talk a lot more about in our Digging Deeper series in a couple weeks in mid-July. Uh, we'll talk about all kinds of new technology in the commercial homeowner market for managing irrigation from your in-ground systems to systems like this that you can hook up to your hose. Awesome. And the question in my ear is, does it play music? Uh, no, I don't think it does. <laughs> so that's a higher model. Yeah. <laughs> the upgrade. Yeah. Okay, Kyle, what do you have? Well, um, I was, a lot of the cone, cone, the uh, prairie cone flowers are starting to, starting to bloom and get those nice, nice, beautiful colors that we all love this time of year. And some are maybe looking like they're producing a second, a second floral head out of the, out of the first flower head. And that is our good old friend Aster Yellows. Um, and so Aster Yellows is caused by a phytoplasma. And phytoplasmas are kind of, they're kind of bacteria that act like viruses. Um, and so that's the best way to, to think about them. And even though they are technically a bacteria, a lot of our controls are the same sorts of controls that we do for viruses. But 
one of the main one of the main symptoms that we will expect to see is the kind of this, just this this phylity, um, or just growth of abnormal growth of tissue that occurs. Um, and so if we were to to come back to this uh, to this cone flower in in a couple of weeks, there's a good chance that we would have a whole nother flower head that's been produced out of each one of these smaller green spots here. And so this is really the time of year when you wanna be out looking in your cone flower beds to control them. As I mentioned, a lot of our controls for viruses are the same for, for this phytoplasma. And so roguing is really all that you can do. This phytoplasma is spread by, um, is spread by leaf hoppers. And so if you're in town, you may be able to you may be able to control the leaf hoppers um, just with a with a, a general insecticide. However, if you are in the country um, or a rural situation, it's going to be very difficult to control any sort of leaf hopper activity. So, really, anytime you start to see see these little things show up in, on the on the heads, that's a sign to um, sign that you'll want to rogue out or um, prune out that entire shoot. And you'll want to make sure you're good getting as close to the ground as possible because again, those leaf hoppers will feed on infected tissue, go to another healthy plant and spread that phytoplasma to the, to the healthy tissue. And there's a lot of that that shows up in the backyard farmer. Garden. Yes, it looks really cool if you, <laughs> if you like things like this, I suppose. It does. All right, uh, Wayne, you get to start with the first round of IDs and you've got five in a row, I think, here. The first one is, uh, she found this one. She says it keeps flipping over and it had trouble walking. What is it? Well, it's a reddish brown stag beetle. Mm -hmm. Larvae feed inside rotting logs. So a cool guy. Yep, and one of our recyclers. A gymnast. All right, and then we have one. This is a Lincoln viewer. Found this on the sidewalk. Uh, the bug, not the wheat penny. He's clear on that one. And wonders what this one is. This is a fiery searcher, also sometimes known as a caterpillar hunter. Wow. or caterpillar searcher, so these things, they're, they're rather large, as you can see by that penny, and very brightly colored. There's another one that's black with those iridescent red spots up and down the abdomen in rows. Fire searcher. Fiery searcher. Fiery searcher, cool. Then we have one from Omaha, saw this beautiful insect. What is that? Okay, this is Osmoderma. This is one of our scarab beetles. There's no English name, so I'm using the Okay. genus name for it. And the, these are another one where the larvae feed in rotting logs, so another one of our recyclers. Excellent, and then we just have to show you this one. This is actually one of our uh, wonderful NET people walking through the backyard farmer garden. That is, was yellow submarine rose. And those are Japanese beetles. <laughs> many of them. Yes, many of them, <laughs> and, having fun. Yeah, and the final one here, I know we had some back and forth on this. Uh, this is a viewer who found the found these beetles all in an aggregation here. It took yes. a while to figure out what they are. Yeah, this is, a, this is about three weeks in the making to mm -hmm. figure all this out. It did end up with a visit mm -hmm. out to this viewer's place. And what we have here, the type of flea beetle called Altissa bimarginata. And unfortunately, we don't have an English name for this one either, but it is one of two flea beetles that look a lot like this that can occur on willows mm -hmm. in Nebraska. So a native. Another one of our natives that's uh, it's got quite a showy feature to it. Cool, very good. All right, I know you love weeds so much. Sue gave me three of them. I did. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't. This is viewers. Oh, okay. <laughs> the first one is from Sioux City. Yep. She wonders what this is and the control. She sent us kind of a close-up here, and then she sent a, a, another picture, yep. kind of in the turf slash landscape. Yeah, this is a uh, birdfoot's trefoil. Uh, it's perennial. It's something that we can be pulling in the landscape. If it's in the turf, most of our, her our standard combination herbicides can clean this up. Uh, things are triclopyr especially, but a lot of the, the herbicides take care of this one. All right, blooming all over right now too. Uh, and then the second one here, uh, she says this is growing randomly where she didn't plant it. This is also a Sioux City viewer, and this one is coming up not only in the landscape beds, but in the turf. Yeah, this is dayflower, and this is one that's really problematic because it seeds uh, uh, intensively, I guess, aggressively. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're just constantly pulling and it just keeps emerging, especially in areas that are thin, that don't have much competition. And then this one is, is taking over that little niche. Okay, 
and control, same thing. Yep, same thing. It's, you know, most of our three ways would control this type of thing too, yep. All right, and your third one, uh, we've had this one before earlier in the season, but yep. here we go again. It's an annual, this is chickweed, but it's just continuing to grow and grow. And uh, so um, it's something that we want to control we, you know, we can get better control early in the spring or in the fall. Right now, it's really liking what's going on and it's really growing. And that's it shows when they're growing aggressively, the herbicide options are much more limited. And so, um, you just it's harder to, to control something that's really healthy. So. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes. We've, oh, tomatoes. We've, we've had a lot of curly top, and this is maybe perhaps different. Your first. I think it's different. <laughs> your first two pictures. Uh, she's got a big boy and a sweet 100. They're wilting overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, the four other tomatoes look healthy. This is an Omaha viewer. Yeah. So um, there are there are some viruses that that can cause some wilting of tomatoes. Tomato spotted wilt is is the main one that we think about. But I don't think that's what's going on here. Um, I think here we have one of our vascular wilt diseases that that's occurring. Unfortunately, can be can't really can't really tell which disease it is. There are two different fungal diseases and a bacterial disease, which all cause very similar symptoms on on tomatoes. You come out in the morning. And the tomatoes are often will be looking in pretty good shape by the end of the afternoon when they've used a lot of their moisture and their water resources when they're using a lot more water than normal. Then we'll see the severe wilting that that has occurred. As far as control, there's really not a whole lot that you can do aside from continuing to provide adequate moisture, uh, maybe doing some mulching along the base of these plants would would help them um, help them retain moisture a little bit better. Unfortunately, you're not going to get the fruit set out of these plants that you would expect, even if they are able to to go through and put off um, put off a a some fruit. All right, and you have another tomato. This is a little Sicily. Um, she's looked for damage. She's finding nothing, and same thing, wilted, floppy. And then you've got another one that's a Shenandoah, Iowa. Turn this way quickly. So. You got three and four yeah. here that are also. So I think I think that first picture that we looked at, where the where the top was starting to wilt, um, really difficult to tell from there. If it is just the just the very top part of the plant where we're seeing that wilting occur, then we could maybe start to think about one of um, about one of our wilting viruses like tomato spotted wilt virus. And if that's the case, then you would want to go ahead and um, and remove that plant uh, before it would have time to spread. The next picture that we had is one of our favorites, um, early blight. Mm -hmm. And as we zoomed in on these, on those lesions, we could see kind of the, the telltale concentric rings that are very common with early blight. And with the, with the moisture and humidity that we've had, we would expect this fungal disease to, to be pretty prolific right about now. As far as control for this disease, um, again, watering from the base of the plant to preve um, prevent splashing those fungal spores higher up is going to be, is really going to help if you are looking for a chemical control, a product that would contain chlorothalonil um, or mancozeb would work pretty well for that. Repeat those two words, please. Chloro chlorothalonil, um, daconil would be a trade name. Okay. Um, and then mancozeb is another product. Excellent, thank you, Kyle. Well, with all the high temperatures and the high humidity we've been having, we are bound to start seeing some of Kyle's spots and rots on our plant material. So here to help us figure out the different types is Kyle himself. We're getting to that time of year when just random spots are showing up on our leaves and we don't really know what these spots are. And we get a lot of questions in Backyard Farmer. I have spots on plant X, spots on plant Y, spots on plant Z. What's going on? Well, unfortunately, we need a little bit more information before we can really come up with a good diagnosis. And so really, when we are looking at these leaf spots, a few different things that you should be looking for. Number one, I always wanna look at the margin of the leaf spot. Is it a fairly, is it a fairly uniform margin? where it's nice and defined by, by with maybe a certain color, maybe the center of the spots are tan and the outsides are red, certain diseases will cause injury, injury like that. Now, the other thing that we always wanna look at when we're talking about leaf spots will be the shape and the size of these spots. 
Two of our main pathogen groups that cause leaf spots are our fungi and our bacteria. And now when we're trying to differentiate, is this a fungal leaf spot, is this a bacterial leaf spot, really just looking at the shape of those margins can give us a fair amount of information. And so with our fungal leaf spots, often those are going to be a little bit more round. As a fungus continues to grow and spread throughout that, um, throughout that leaf surface, and we'll kind of get that round, that roundish shape, or maybe elliptical. Whereas a lot of our bacterial pathogens are a little bit weaker, and they're not able to cross those leaf veins, which means that a lot of the bacterial leaf spot lesions tend to be a little bit angular at first. And so eventually, as they, as they grow, they may, they may coalesce or come together to form a larger, more round leaf spot. But at least initially, those bacterial spots tend to be smaller and again, kind of more angular as they're restricted by the leaf veins. Now, some of the other things that we always want to look at when we're talking about our leaf spots are colors, but not only the color on the top of the leaf, but what does it look like on the underside of the leaf as well. Certain pathogens may form little structures on the underside of our leaves. As we think about a lot of our rust diseases, a lot of our rust diseases, you look at the bottom of the leaf and you'll just see some kind of fingers or tendrils that are coming down underneath those lesions. And those are symptomatic or diagnostic for the rust fungus. If we, have, if we are seeing these leaf spots and we have determined that the issue is pathological in nature, some of the main things that we can do, at least for fungi and bacteria, number one is sanitation. And so making sure that as soon as we see some of these leaf spots appear, we're working, as, working to get them out of the garden as quickly as we can. The other thing that works very well for a lot of these leaf spots is monitoring our watering schedule. And so we want to irrigate early in the morning so that the, so that the water has all day to, to dry off of the leaves and so we don't have an extended leaf wetness period. The longer the leaves stay wet, the more likely they are to, to be infected by, by a lot of these diseases. Now, if you are looking for a chemical control, you really need to know what you're dealing with. A fungicide will not work on a bacterial leaf spot. So if, you're, if you have bacterial speck and peppers, fungicides will not control that. And so it is very important to always know what sort of leaf spot you're working with before we start thinking about any sort of control options. We keep telling you on Backyard Farmer, you have to know what you're looking at before you can begin any effective treatment. So Kyle, thank you for that. And we will continue to say, you gotta know what you've got before you know what you can do. Indeed, the yeah, first part of integrated pest management is knowing what that pest is. Exactly. I concur. <laughs> okay, so you have a very interesting and awful peach. Oh, yes. uh, this is the first year they've set about 30 peaches on their two peach trees in Omaha, and now look, what is this? This is characteristic of oriental fruit moth uh, larvae burrowing into the peach. So each one of those should be a point where a larvae is burrowed in. So control at this point, pick it off, dispose of it. So they can, There'll be another generation coming later that will burrow into the new shoots of this year. So the actual peach tree itself. Yes. So how do you control it for next year? For next year, you almost have to be on a fruit tree spray schedule. Okay. What I do with my peach tree is I just pull it off and I get rid of it. And I never see more than one or two a year. Okay, all right. And yeah, Ugh. too much protein in that peach. <laughs> okay, so your second one here, Wayne, uh, this is a West Point viewer. Uh, she sent a couple pictures here, and it's the second year they're dealing with these nasty critters on their asparagus. They eat an entire stem in a day. They cleaned up the foliage. They're back even earlier. So what do we have going on here? We have asparagus beetle larvae. Mm -hmm. And since they're larvae, you can try some of the insecticidal soaps because those tend to work better on the larvae of insects that have that full complete life cycle. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they can do uh, right now, they can pick them off mm -hmm. if there's an, a will to be out in the heat and humidity mm -hmm. and doing that. And then they can also use some of our insecticides that are labeled for vegetable garden use. Since the asparagus is past point of eating, we've got a long period of time 
before we have to worry about that pre-harvest interval being an issue. Okay, good, so good time to control. Yes. All right, Bill, I only gave you one picture on this, but I'm gonna make you okay. answer more than this one question based on another question Let's from our it. viewer. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> so this is a Bellevue viewer who okay. had a large ash removed and had the stump ground down. He wants to know the plan for getting turf established here, and we did have another viewer say, "What? It, how do you how do you get yeah. turf established from the start in a regular lawn situation or this?" I was at my parents' house two weeks ago. Live in Wisconsin. All the big ash trees in the front yard gone, and they all have this right oh 40, 50 foot ash. I mean, huge ash yeah. gone. Um, this is a, an example of where we, one thing I'm gonna do first is grind them down, right? And, and make sure we grind it down deep enough that we can have some topsoil on the top. Uh, as this, as the roots start to decay, uh, microbes are gonna start stealing nitrogen fertilizer. And so we're always gonna have this kind of deficiency going on uh, once our lawn is established. Either if we seeded it or sodded it, I don't care. Is that my, those microbes are stealing fertilizer, that means our grass isn't getting it. Microbes always get first dibs on fertilizer. So what we wanna do is make sure we grind that down, come in with the topsoil. You don't wanna get that like black topsoil you get from a garden center. You want like actual soil that's like a healthy black, we call it A horizon, mm -hmm. put it back in there. Um, and then we can seed or sod. But the real thing to think about is that longer term management of, you know, I might need a little bit extra fertilizer. And one thing you can actually do is you can get like an organic fertilizer and you could actually put it in with your seed because that will release over three to four years. Like some of those sewage sludge products like melorganite, it's got a three year release. Wow. And so that will help feed those microbes to break down the organic matter underneath. You might see some mushrooms, mm -hmm. but um, it's not gonna hurt the turf, but it's gonna prevent it from getting yellow compared to the rest of the lawn. Excellent, that's great advice. All right, thanks, Bill. Did I do too it? Bad, too bad about the ash. You did. Yeah, okay. Answer to both. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Kyle, you have one, two, three, four, five here that are truly rotty and spotty. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one here is <laughs> flowering pear in Lincoln, and your second one is a Cleveland pear. Uh, with the reddish brown spots. And, and I that could be any pear tree in the country right now, exactly. really. Exactly, um, right. Yep, and this is one of our our good friend, old pear rust. Um, and so there is, there has been some some recent discoveries in terms of, in terms of the, um, the fungal morphology in pear rusts. And turns out there is a little bit more diversity out there than we were originally thinking. And some of the other, other rusts may attack pears as well. Um, so if you do think that you've been seeing an increase in, in pear rust over the last couple of years, you're not the only one. We've, we've been noticing that too. Um, as far as control, you know, once you're seeing spots like this, there's really nothing that you can do. Um, best time to control this is when the, um, early in the spring, when those pears are just beginning to flower, and that's when you want to want to come in and apply a fungicide. Um, but again, right now, really nothing to do except to ma maintain overall health of the tree and uh, maybe think about uh, management next year. All right, excellent. Then you have, this is from a sustaining NET member. I need to throw that in because that's great. And this is, uh, he thought they were eggs, but it's on an ash. What is this? Yeah, and uh, this is another another one of our rusts. This is actually uh, Kint's rust. And so similar to similar to pear rust, similar to, to cedar apple rust, this is cedar Kint's rust. Um, and so it, it will form some lesions or galls on cedar trees um, in the spring or early spring, and they get those orange, orange horns. And then this is the um, this is the ash stage of it. Uh, and again, once you're seeing this on an ash tree, not a whole lot that you can do to um, do to control it. Generally, in Nebraska, we don't have enough moisture that this disease is enough to warrant disease anyway. And so I would probably just just live with it. And next year, if you're seeing a lot of injury, maybe early defoliation, then think about. Um, a fungicide application, but again, early in the spring is when you'd want to be doing that fungicide. All right, and your last two are rots and spots from Gehring. This is ash again, and I think your next one is a Washington hawthorn. Yeah, so um, cedar hawthorn rusts is what we what we have what we have on these, um, and so again, similar, very similar fungi. They they will overwinter kind of on the on the cedar trees. 
And then when it's spring and um, spring comes, it warms up, we get the moisture, then these fungi are blowing to their alternate hosts, whether they are pears, apples, hawthorns, kints, you name it. Control is always going to be the same, that um, fungicide application early in the spring. Again, when we're seeing those kind of orange uh, gelat gelatinous horns form on cedar trees, that's when you want to start thinking about um, a fungicide application on any of our ornamentals. All right, thank you so much. Well, we are happy to say we've already got some vegetables to show you out at our garden. It's really amazing to see how quickly everything responded after that late start. So let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, everything is looking fantastic. Uh, Lincoln this week got almost two inches of rain, so that's great. Uh, irrigation system won't have to turn on. Um, and we do have water sensors, so we are safe there. Produce is starting to come alive, and we're going to have some produce that we're going to be harvesting here soon. But last week was pollinator week, so we have lots of pollinators that we were able to celebrate last week in the backyard farmer garden. We saw monarchs on the milkweeds. Uh, we've been looking for some of their eggs. We see lots of aphids on them too. We've got Joe pie weeds starting. We've got lots of cone flower going. So we have lots and lots of flowers in our garden that are helping feed those pollinators. So if you want to see some pollinators, stop by the backyard farmer garden and check it out. You right now, it is time for lightning. You ready, Kyle? Oh, I get to go first this time. You do, we always go this way. Yes. <laughs> okay, your first question. Is it too hot to spray for powdery mildew right now and they want to use tebuconazole? Um, I would not recommend spraying for powdery mildew right now, no. All right, the high temperatures and the humidity that we are having right now, is there anything people can do to reduce the disease pressure? Um, you know, anything that you, any pruning or anything to increase airflow through the canopies should help. All right, this is a viewer in Lincoln who has a Swiss stone pine. The needles are browning from the tips in with banding on them. Is that a disease? Uh, yeah, most likely that's going to be Dothostroma needle blight. Um, not a whole lot to do about it this time of year, but next spring we can uh, think about some control options. All right, and we have another viewer who wants to know, do you use copper sulfate for Dothostroma? Uh, copper sulfate can work for Dothostroma. However, you want to be careful of your formulation of copper because there has been some phytotoxic um, effects that have been shown. All right, we have zucchini that are soft and rotting from the stem end. What is that? Um, could be... Uh, mad rot. From the stem end? Mm -hmm. Blossom, I'd be from the blossom end yeah. if it was blossom end rot. I know. Um, <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, we don't, we don't know on that one. Uh, I, would, <laughs> I would love to see a picture um, of that if I could have one. All right, excellent. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is a Dodge viewer, Bill. They want to know uh, what to do to get rid of night crawlers in their lawn. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> it's not nothing's labeled illegal to do it. So Excellent. I'm not just hedging there. <laughs> Perfect. This is a viewer who wants to know, we always recommend pre-emerge in the fall for the winter annuals. What pre-emerge and when? Depends what you're going for. If it's a broadleaf weed, some of the things like gallery um, can work for some of those winter annuals that are kind of more broadleaf. And for the grasses, traditionally most of our uh, uh, ones that work in the spring in the spring work in the fall for our winter annual grasses, so. All right, this is a Valentine viewer who wants to know, is it possible to fall seed buffalo grass? Yeah, we wanna do it late. So, you know, when it's not, has any chance of germinating. So in Valentine, maybe late October. All right, this is a North Platte viewer who says their fescue went to seed, then they mowed and the crowns look dead. Yeah, it probably got pretty high and you probably scalped it. It might come back, the seed's not gonna do anything um, because it's, not going to be a good genetic material, but uh, hopefully it'll recover with some normal mowing. Okay, excellent. Ready, Wayne? Let's go. <laughs> the first question is one that we've gotten from a lot of viewers, which is where are the bees? Where are the bees? Well, have a bee hotel. Okay. Encourage them in your landscape. All right. 
This is a Bennington viewer who says she's got green worms in her kale and her Brussels sprouts. What are they and how oh, to control like them? Sounds like an old cabbage white butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, any of your products containing carbaryl or permethrin should work well for those. All right. A Fremont viewer wants to know whether insecticidal soap will hurt perennials and annuals. If used according to label directions, it should not. All right. Uh, the same viewer wants to know, does that work on Japanese beetles? Insecticidal soaps generally won't work very well on Japanese beetles because they don't work well on adults. We like using them on soft-bodied immatures. All right. Uh, Bellevue viewer has little worms dropping out of their locust tree. Little worms. There's a couple things that it could be. Could be some of our fall webworms getting going. Could be a couple other caterpillars. All right. This is a Cedar Rapids, Nebraska viewer who says they think flea beetles kill their beets, et cetera. What's the control for flea beetles? Flea beetles, carbaryl works really well for those. All right. Excellent. Nice job, all. Nice job. Mm -hmm. Insects were easier this time. <laughs> <laughs> Not on purpose. <laughs> all right. Since we don't have a horticulturist and I don't trust any of you, I get to do I don't this. For good reason. <laughs> I'm a turkey now. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, red, white, and blue for the 4th of July, of course. This one that is actually closing for the evening, unfortunately, is called Stokes Aster. And this is a cultivar called Klaus Gelito. Beautiful, beautiful. They, they will open to two or three inches across in the backyard farmer garden. Um, the tall ones, we've talked already about larkspur, I think, on the show. This is an annual, but we've got the white one here as well as the one that our camera people say it's purple. It's closer to blue than the, anything else. And then we have one rose out of our backyard farmer garden. This is one called Home Run that actually survived the Japanese beetle onslaught. So a little bit of a, a Fourth of July combination in Plants of the Week. But purple to me, too. I'm going to side with the camera crew. <laughs> it's as close as I could get to blue. <laughs> All right, you ready for the next round of pictures? Sure. Sure. Okay, this is a viewer that uh, lives north of Garland. She says the number of ticks in the apiary are off the charts. And she found these f hiding on a stake. She wonders what they are. Well, these are American dog ticks. The top one is female. You can tell that by the coloration pattern. Mm -hmm. It's more con concentrated. And then you get to the next two down, those are males, and it's more of a mottled pattern going across. And that's how we know those are males. So you can tell across that. Jody and I were actually having an interesting discussion this afternoon. Apparently, there's something about apiaries where tick concentration is higher. That's sort of creepy. Yeah. But they're all the same tick. Yeah. Yes, those are all four of those, including the one down at the bottom you can hardly right. see. And yes, that is a honey bee in the background. It's blurred. There we go. <laughs> we, there are the, we there are the that bees. One too. <laughs> all right. Um, so your next one here is a, this is a Lincoln viewer. Please identify this. She's found these in her house. Okay, this is one of our assassin bugs that is a common home invader. This is a masked hunter. Mm -hmm. Be careful if you ever try to pick one of these up with your bare hands. They pack a punch when they bite, because when they bite, they jab their mouth, piercing, sucking mouth part into you and inject digestive enzymes. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, don't capture. This oh. is jar capture and Charged release. Jar. <laughs> okay. And then we have one, uh, this is a Marquette, Nebraska viewer. She found this enjoying her uh, bee balm or Monarda, half an inch long. And she said it kind of reminded her a little bit of a hummingbird. It does. This is one of our bee flies. Um, mm. They're in this family called Bombyliidae, and they're actually one of our ones that can pollinate as adults, but as the larvae or the maggots, they're actually parasitic on a lot of other insects. So this is one of our good guys in two different fashions. That's really cool. And in, in true entomol entomological fashion, the name for it is a bee fly. Yes. Make up your mind. <laughs> it's, some, it's a fly that looks like a bee. <laughs> okay. Bill, turf questions. Yep. Uh, this ABC here, this is an Omaha viewer, invades the iris beds, the daylily beds. She did spray Roundup. It just laughed and said, try again with something else. Uh, she gave us one that's the, um, the roots and the shoots and everything else. She is planning on this one to 
till and kill, but she wants to kill before she tills. What is this? Yeah, I would definitely try to kill before you till. Uh, we pre I'm pretty sure this is uh, Johnson grass. It grows, it has these very smooth leaves that look like that, and it can grow up to eight feet tall. Oh. So it really does grow aggressively, but it's also rhizomerous, so that means it will spread mm -hmm. um, and have all daughter plants. And so tilling and then killing, you might just till it and evenly to spread it and then try to have to kill a lot more plants instead of a couple big ones. Um, Unfortunately, your non-selectives, like your Roundup, really are the best choice. So read that label to make sure you're really optimizing that application. Um, if it would be in your lawn um, and you still had it and it was lingering, there are some um, selective options like Tenacity, Mesotrione, um, something that maybe a lawn care person would be able to, uh, to take care of for you. Um, but unfortunately, this one is you'd probably want to control it with a non-selective. Make sure it's really dead before you'd want to go in and till that up. All right, and then your next one is actually from uh, Arapaho and says it's in a lot of uh, yards in Arapaho. Yeah, and uh, we have this, these articles that go out every week or two called Turf Infos that Rock and I write, and Rock wrote a, an article about this one a couple weeks ago called, Why is the foxtail flowering already? Because it's not foxtail. Uh, it's, <laughs> this is a little barley. Uh, it's a winter annual, and so it grew in the winter. Uh, normally it's going to start dying now with the heat, so we'll see that. Uh, something I wouldn't be too worried about. Again, this would be another non-selective maybe earlier in the fall if you'd see it, um, or you could do your Tenacity app if it is in your lawn and you need some kind of selective control uh, to try to get rid of that guy. All right, excellent, thank you so much. Okay, this is really, I think, our first um, pathological bean this year. This is a viewer that uh, sent us three pictures of this. She's, she's, she says leaf curl virus. Sunny location, she has Japanese beetles, but this is not it. So what is this? She sent, I think, three pictures of this, Kyle. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing she may have Japanese beetles. The ones she's probably not seen, there are the aphids that are most likely spreading this. Um, to me, this looks like the, the bean common mosaic virus, um, which as the name implies, it's a fairly common virus um, that we see on, see on a lot of beans. Um, we see it on, on edible beans, all, all, all over green beans, you name it. Um, you know, not a whole lot to do right now. There are, there are no treatments for, um, for this. Whenever we have a virus infected plant, you know, best thing to do in that situation is, is normally to, to pull it out and to rogue it out. We don't, we don't really know what sort of fruits that we'll get off of it. Um, but you will, anything that you can do to control the aphids there um, should, should potentially help. And, and Wayne, aphid control can be difficult, to say the least. It depends. Depends. Um, <laughs> it depends on which aphid you're dealing with. Yeah. If you're dealing with something like green peach aphid that has the most insecticide resistances in a single insect species, it can be quite difficult. Yeah. If, and that's your to hose, insecticidal soaps, things that are gonna be a little more non-traditional insecticide approach to really try and manage those. If it's some of the other aphid species, you can use some of our more broad spectrum products. Stay away from the carburils, those, like I've repeatedly say, piercing sucking mouth parts, don't use carburil, use permethrins All or right. those types. Okay, and then your next one is potatoes. Ooh. This is Yukon Golds. The leaves are curling and dying. He's thinking this is blight. Yeah, and I and I agree. Um, you know, we zoomed in on zoomed in on these lesions as well, and it's pretty similar to the tomato leaves that I saw earlier. We do have some some con 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 some concentric rings, then with that nice yellow halo around there. That is very typical of of early blight. Um, it's the same fungus that causes early blight in tomatoes, and so it's an alternaria fungus. Same control options as in tomatoes for potatoes. So fungicide controls, um, chloroth chlorothalonil or daconil would work. Um, same with mancozeb. Other things to do would be, um, be mulching and make sure that you're watering from the base of the plant to avoid soil splashing up. All right, thank you, Kyle. Well. All that hard work you've put in this year getting your vegetable garden can start having holes in it during this time of year because those bugs are hungry. The only way you're going to know what is out there and it is to get out there and see what's happening. So Jody Green is going to join us now and talk about scouting for insects. <music> in the Hope Garden and we are gonna do some scouting. We're gonna be out here looking for some information 
We want to have early detection of any pests, pathogens, weeds, or problems in our vegetable garden. This way we can adopt IPM early and have success so we can produce a lot of vegetables that we can donate. Some things to keep in mind before you scout is that you want this to be timely. Once you put those seedlings or plants in the ground, they're open to environmental stress, to bugs and pathogens. So you wanna do this before pests become a problem. Two, you wanna use the tools that you have at hand. Hand lens, your camera, a pocket knife. You can even have some vials or little baggies to take back specimens. You wanna do this different times of the day, maybe early morning or in the evening, when it's cooler and pests come out when we're not looking. You want to check the plants, the leaves, the top, and especially those undersides of the leaves where pests hide. Check the stem and check the soil around and also the mulch. There could be pests hiding there. You want to look for live insects, look for damage, look for eggs, pupae, conducive conditions where maybe moisture is accumulating, and look for those natural enemies. That will be an indicator that there are pests nearby for them to eat. And lastly, always, always identify the pest, whether it's a pathogen, an insect, or environmental condition. You can send your picture to Backyard Farmer and we can help you with that. Let's take a look at some examples. So here I've got a squash plant and what I'm gonna do is scout for squash vine borer and also squash bugs. I'm gonna look near the stem, near the base for eggs laid by the squash vine borer moth. And I'm also gonna check the leaves and the undersurface for nymphs of squash bugs and also their eggs. They're normally laid in mass, they're reddish color and usually 20 to 25. You want to squish those and get rid of those so the nymphs don't emerge. So now we're in the cabbage patch. We are looking for pests that defoliate cabbage. Some of these are going to be the diamondback moth caterpillar, the cabbage looper, and the imported cabbage worm. You may see some of these white butterflies fluttering around. They are beautiful as butterflies, but as little larvae, they will defoliate cabbage. Another thing to do is check all of the leaves around some of the plants that look like they've been chewed on and pick off those caterpillars and pupae and any eggs that you see and look right at those little heads. There may be cutworms inside. Our last example is here with the cucumber plants. We are scouting for the cucumber beetle. There's the spotted and the striped cucumber beetle. They can cause bacterial wilt of the cucumber plant, so you want to get those early. So as you can see, the key to prevention is getting out and scouting your garden. Find those pests before they become problems. Regular scouting for those little boogers or the disease problem should be part of your regular gardening routine. It is a lot better to get ahead of the problem before it's too late. And besides which, it's fun to walk around in the garden, even if you find creepy stuff. Okay. Some of us like creepy stuff. I know. That's yeah, creepy. <laughs> it's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a really interesting one. This is a, a, a cactus patch in Kearney. Wayne, and she thinks it's mealybugs. Um, are they mealybugs or relatives, and when did they move outside? Well, my best take on this, and it would take some field experience to figure it out for sure, this might actually be coconil. Oh. Uh, we do have some wild coconil species that occur on cactus. If you even go down mm -hmm. to Mexico, they will farm coconil on cactus right. pads. And I think this is what you're going to have going on here. Uh, hose, rinse it off, is probably the best thing you could do. Um, if you want to confirm that it is cochineal, squish some mm -hmm. and see if you get that really nice red dye, lots of liquids gushing out, and that's the key character for cochineal. Very cool, interesting. Which is closely related to scales and mealybugs and right Excellent. in the neck of the woods. Okay, this is also a carny viewer. Um, numerous cedar trees. Uh, it was identified by extension as a scale insect and the resulting sooty mold. She's wondering, will it uh, reoccur? She's got deciduous trees and shrubs and um, they've got a lot of cedars. So what do we think on this? Part of that question too is that they've been battling bag with worms. bag worms. Right. And so part of what I think is going on here is they were fighting the bag worms with a broad spectrum insecticide. Mm -hmm. 
The scales have moved in and stayed put because they have that hard waxy coating over the top that we typically can't get an insecticide through. Mm -hmm. So by clearing out the bagworms, they've cleared out their beneficial insects that would have eaten on the scales. So this is kind of a unfortunate side effect of using one of our broad spectrum insecticides. And it's a good example of why we wanna be selective when we can be and some of the things that can happen when we do use a broad spectrum. In this case, uh, hopefully you can have more predators move back in. If you continue to have the problems with the sooty mold, which is growing on the honeydew from the scales, you may need to go in and do some applications. This is actually about the right time to control the scale because this is called Fletcher scale. Mm. and they overwinter as second instar nymphs. And they're in the adult stage, so we're gonna get the crawlers here very soon. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get them with a well-timed topical then. Or you can go for acephate. Acephate is getting tougher to find. Uh, there are still some homeowner-based formulations out there. You may have to go to the web to find them, but they do work really well for our scale insects on our, on our conifers. Excellent, thank you, Wayne. Okay, so uh, this is a Bloomfield uh, viewer, and this is how to get rid of the shrooms. And you got this because it's in turf and because <laughs> Path had too many questions this week. <laughs> yep. Uh, you're not. Um, these are these are uh, cyprophytic uh, fungi. I mean, they're breaking down organic matter in the soil, uh, like we were talking about in the question with the this, this tree stumps, and so. There are fungicides in the real professional market that would help with this when it's like a farrier ring type of a situation. But you know, as long as that food source is there, it's going to be consumed by some at some point, especially when the weather is right. And so it's not hurting the lawn. You're just going to mow it off. Uh, like Kyle told me, this is called mower's mushroom. Mower mushrooms. Right? Mo yeah, so. most likely it's this is one of a mower's mushroom, but also just one of our. This is one of our general little brown mushrooms, and these, you know, they're. They're in turf all over the place, especially after we've had some rains like we've had. They're gonna pop up. Most of them are not concerning it at all. Um, most of them are not poisonous either. So again, mowing and you should be fine. Yep. All right, and your second one is also a fungus, mm -hmm. but it's also a, a carny viewer. They've never had this one, small four inch diameter yep. circles in the turf again, which That's, is why you get it. Yep, and it's another thing not really hurting the turf. Uh, this is a slime mold and it is just uh, sitting on there and it's eating the, the, wax, the, uh, oil, the sugars that are on the surface of the turf. And they're not really doing any kind of damage at all. Uh, just the weather was right, the sugar was there, and it's kind of grown and uh, taken off. Yeah, I mean, if anyone had any, um, anything that looked like dog vomit in their yard over the past week or so, that's just another, another type of slime mold. It's the exact same thing. It's not harming the turf at all. All right, excellent. All right, thank you. Uh, your turn, Kyle. Uh, this is a zucchini. Uh, leaf, which uh, she says they're turning blue, and she wonders what this is from. And this uh, is La Vista. It kind of looks. I didn't really get a blue color there. I, I think that I think this is powdery mildew is what we're what we're dealing with. And as we look um, where on the leaf we're seeing the white occur, it's kind of where the veins are. So it's going to be a lower area of the leaf where there, where a little bit more moisture um, is held. So again, you know, moisture, um, making sure that we are watering from the base so we're not leaving um, droplets of moisture on top of the leaves should help prevent this in the future. All right, and then your second one here, uh, this is squash plants. She's wondering, is this viral? Do they just use the, pull them because they, they can't use um, sprays? This is a school garden. Yeah. Um, it, very, it's very possible that this is viral, um, you know, especially as we look at the other squash plant next to it, how, how that one's thriving compared to this. Anytime we have some general yellowing or chlorosis and that stunted growth, it easily can be a virus. And there are quite a few that do hit squashes. Um, hard to tell which one it is from here, but regardless, the control is all the same and that's just going to be removing the plant. Make sure you are removing as much of the plant, including root material, as possible because that virus can survive in the root particles. All right, excellent, thank you so much. Well, of course, we have announcements of interesting things going on in the gardening world occasionally, and we have a couple of those. Uh, one is the Prairie Open House this coming Sunday. This is what, uh, Wachiska Audubon Society, so you can go to their website 
and this is in Utan, and I know they are concentrating a lot on those pollinators in the prairie right now. And our second one is us, of course, Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook, Thursdays right after Backyard Farmer at 8 p.m. Central. Follow us on Backyard Farmer and on NET Nebraska to uh, give us your comments about Digging Deeper. That's always a very interesting experience since you've all been my victims on that at this point. Yep. <laughs> all right, so we have time for a few questions. I haven't uh, been your victim yet. No, but you're going to. And you, and you, you better not bring a live creature when you do. Um, Where's the fun in that? I know. Spiders is what he's going to be talking about. <laughs> okay, so Wayne, uh, this is a viewer who has been growing lunchbox peppers, and she's thinking there's some insects that are beginning to either chew on the peppers or chew on the foliage. Are you seeing anything, or do you know what would be munching away on, your pep on the peppers, other than peeps, as in people? <laughs> They're not quite ready yet. <laughs> Uh, some of our caterpillars in that uh, noctuid family will get on there, like our uh, corn earworms. Corn earworm will get on a lot of different things. You know, they'll get into the tomato fruits. They can also get into pepper fruits because they're both those solanaceous plants. Mm -hmm. um, also, that um, why can't I think of the? I can think of a scientific name. At least the species is virescence, but oh, uh, tobacco bedworm. Oh, sure. Tobacco bedworm yeah. will also feed on peppers. All right, excellent. And so uh, she needs to send a pick, maybe. Yeah, for good identification okay. to see what's going on, make sure it's not something of Kyle's getting going mm -hmm. to. All right. Okay, Bill, so we have a question about dollar spots starting and fertilizing. Yeah, so dollar spot is a disease that we see. Um, looks a little kind of silver dollar sized spaces in your lawn. When you have high humidity and temperature, uh, it starts to pop up. And so uh, we can see this disease. Um, which generally we talk about as being a low fertility disease. And then we talk about other diseases that are popping up right now, like brown patch, which we generally consider to be high uh, fertility diseases. And so when we're trying to manage these diseases, the first part is growth rate. And so if your lawn right now is looking kind of yellow, especially in new neighborhoods, uh, it's not growing very rig vigorously, these diseases are gonna become really problematic, especially in bluegrass for the dollar spot and the brown patch and the tall fescue. So it is okay to fertilize now if you're not getting about an inch or an inch and a half of growth per week. Uh, I know I went three weeks and I decided I had to fertilize because I didn't have to mow for two and a half weeks. And so use your mower to guide the fertility applications and that will help to minimize those pests. Excellent. Good advice. All right, Kyle, so uh, this is a viewer who is, has vinca, so vinca minor, and uh, it's heavily wooded. The garden bed is 20 years old. He's seeing these dark stems. All of a sudden, big patches of his vinca are just collapsing with dark stems. Any idea on that one? Uh, it really sounds like, um, sounds like one of our root rots. Phytophthora root rot will typically um, have some black discoloration as it comes up the stem. And so I would, I'd really wonder if that bed um, was just, was really flooded this year. Um, and uh, where, where was he from? Um, Sarpy County in, Sarpy in County. the woods. Yeah. So it's, I mean, certain parts of the state have been inundated with water. I know other parts have not, but, but yeah, any of these areas that have gotten a lot of moisture, we are seeing some of these root rots show up. Not a whole lot to do, um, aside from just trying to dry that area out as best as possible. All right, thank you, Kyle. I know we have had that on campus in a couple beds as well. Yeah, I know uh, last year, um, last fall, we had a few that came right. in. Uh, this is an interesting one. We'll see what you think about this. This is a viewer uh, who has watched us talk about Japanese beetles and has used uh, Gabriel's Milky Spore. You treat spring, summer, fall for two years, and then it, you don't get them again for about 10. You ever heard of using that? I have heard of Milky Spore, and it's one of our bacillus species. We have right. Bacillus thuringiensis, which we like to use for a lot of other insects. This one is Bacillus papillae, mm -hmm. which is named after the Japanese beetle. Mm -hmm. And this one works much better further east of us than it does, I mean, even in Iowa, it does not work very well. Okay. So unfortunately, it's, it's not a great um, tool. You can try it as long as you're using it according to the label. Okay. However, at this point, it's probably not one of your best bets for Japanese beetle control. Excellent, but nice to know it works in, uh, she said, Illinois.